I'm happy to uh, share our uh, experiences with uh, this online SPE system. Um, I personally don't come from a background in environmental chemistry or water analysis per se, so we've, we've been heavily involved in this with a project I'm going to talk about for about two years, but I think in a way uh, the, the amount of progress we've made in a short time is a testament to the, the ease of use of this system. We're really quite happy with it. Um, so uh, as Annika said, I uh, live in Minnesota in the U.S., and uh, we have a state-funded project um, that's supporting uh, determining antibiotic concentrations in some local rivers. So I'll just briefly uh, give you an overview of the project and, and why uh, we're particularly interested in this analytical setup, uh, describe a little bit about how it works, and then talk just a little bit about uh, some of the issues that uh, – are related to some of the questions that have come up here in terms of robustness uh, and uh, how many samples you can run and things like that. Um, and then briefly give you some examples of the analytical data we've seen. And then uh, right now we're kind of uh, moving in the direction of actually doing, so my, my main research focus is in 2D chromatography. So we're actually right now trying to couple two of the solutions uh, from Agilent. And uh, again, that has been very straightforward so far. So these are the compounds that we've been looking at. Uh, this project is part of a collaboration with uh, two other groups who are doing biological work on these same sam uh, water samples. So initially we've started out with a pretty broad uh, view, looking at compounds from several different classes here. Uh, and if, you know, if, if you've done any work with uh, especially some of these compounds, you know that they're not notoriously difficult to work with. The tetracyclines stick to everything, uh, really difficult to recover at low, low concentrations. And so I think... The chemical diversity here um, uh, represents uh, a challenge. And when we got started in this about two years ago, we adopted or, or tried using an offline SPE method from Diana Aga's group in Buffalo, here cited at the, at the bottom. Uh, I think they have one of the most comprehensive studies in the literature looking at the recovery of, of tetracyclines um, in particular. And so we looked, you see what we have here is um, Spike recoveries, so we spiked at 100 parts per trillion or 1 ppb for sulfamidoxazole. And we have spike recoveries um, for these six compounds over about 10 different sampling sites, ranging from relatively clean creek water to fairly muddy river water with a lot of clay in it to um, also wastewater treatment plant uh, effluent and influent. And uh, what was really frustrating and disturbing to us is that not only are some of these recoveries with the best method you know we know of uh, below 50 percent, but they also vary by site a lot. And so you can do all the development you want on a particular sample, but then if you can't translate that method to a different site, then you spend all of your time doing method development and you spend none of your time actually getting data that you need. And so we actually at this point had, uh, prior to our involvement with Agilent, had um, started looking at on an SP as a way to get around this because we were finding that we were losing a lot of these compounds during the sample reconstitution process after SP and solvent evaporation and things like that. So, and so because we see that uh, these recoveries slash matrix effects, depending on how exactly you evaluate that, because these things vary a lot site by site. We're really interested in using the standard addition approach to quantitation because this uh, helps get around that, that issue um, substantially. And, and so the, the ease of use of the system and the, the extent to which you can automate the process makes quantitation by standard addition more feasible, um, at least at the level of sample volumes that we're dealing with. And so there's a question about how much you do you need to inject. Well, that is really largely driven by well, at least in part driven by your detector sensitivity. And in our case here, we're using a triple quad from Varian that's about five years old. It's probably easily a couple of, order mag couple of orders of magnitude less sensitive uh, compared to what we have today. And so we really have the need to pre-concentrate a lot to reach the low PPT uh, detection levels that we're interested in. And this uh, setup provides a path to do that. Um, so our process now is very simple. Uh, we go out uh, with polypropylene conical centrifuge tubes to collect our water uh, samples. We add EDTA. We adjust to pH 4 with uh, acetic acid, and then whatever spiking that we're going to do for uh, standard addition is done at that point. Then we simply centrifuge them in the same 50 mil conical tubes for about 15 minutes. We transfer the supernatant to a 
to a clean tube, and that is the container that we sample directly out of using the instrument. So at that point, those, those are the solutions we take right to the instrument. Um, so it, it's very straightforward in terms of the sample prep, if you want to call it that even. So this is a, just a picture, a snapshot of the FlexCube module um, that was talked about a moment ago. Just to show you that it's a pretty clean uh, setup, if you will. Um, so we, we have this um, six-port valve here is used to switch the, uh, the SP cartridge, or basically it's just a guard column, uh, analytical guard column, as was mentioned before. That's what we use. That six-port valve is just used to switch that cartridge in and out of the flow, flow path to the analytical column. And this 13-port um, valve here has one in, well, 13 ins, I guess, and one out, effectively. And that's uh, all these Teflon tubes here uh, going into our centrifuge tubes are what's used to actually pull the sample out of, the, out of these tubes and into the, uh, into the instrument. And so everything in this gray box here, all those components are basically housed in the flex cube. We have for our analytical pumping system, we're using the binary 1290 pump. And then, as I said, we're using a Varian uh, triple quad for detection. So I think it's uh, useful to, to show you some of the flow paths here. So in this configuration, this is basically the, the sample loading configuration. So we're using the flex cube pump over here to draw a sample out of this first tube. Uh, so we go into this valve here, and then the flex cube pulls it out of there and into the SPE cartridge. Or Again, it's just a guard comm. In this case, we're using 5 micron particles in a 1 centimeter long cartridge. Uh, the excess uh, goes to waste here. And then uh, we, and so in most of our work, we've been pulling in five milliliters of each of these samples. We've done, I think the most we've done is maybe 10 milliliters, but basically it's just limited by how long you want to wait. So the capability of the pump, uh, as she said, is four milliliters a minute at the top end and 60 bar. So it's how much you can load is simply a function of how long you want to wait and how big your particles are and how long the cartridge is, basically. So once, uh, so we typically we're loading at one, one milliliter per minute, and so we wait five minutes there, and, and then we switch this six-port valve. So then in this kit configuration, we're using our analytical pump here to back flush this uh, cartridge into our analytical column and onto detection. Then at the, the end of the analytical run, we do some washing steps uh, of the cartridge, and, and one of those is shown here. So we, for washing our cartridge, and, and so to answer one of the previous questions, how many injections can you get? Typically through a cartridge like this, we're making maybe 50 or so analyses at five mils per analysis. And at the end of each run, we're using a cocktail here in this SP rinse of uh, basically 50-50 methanol and a CNI trial with a little bit of formic acid in it. And so we, we use the flex cube pump to pull in that rinse solution through this valve uh, and run that through the cartridge to clean it up and, and minimize carryover. And this, we, we found that actually flushing this entire flow path from the 13 port valve to the cartridge is really important in terms of really minimizing carryover. So that, that's been our experience. And the other thing I'll emphasize in this diagram is that we've found that it's really important with these varied water samples to have this little uh, five micron stainless steel mesh screen that's positioned right here in the center port of this valve. So basically it's, it doesn't have to be there, but it's basically between the sample and the flux cube pump. Um, if we don't have that screen there, what we think is going on is that when we centrifuge the samples, we have some low density material. Like when we're doing, dealing with wastewater effluent, we have some, you know, tissue, uh, toilet paper residue in there that doesn't centrifuge well. And we, we don't take any other means to remove that from the sample. We don't have a filter because then we have losses in the filtration. And uh, so we find that, that that mesh, so it's not a filter per se, it's not a porous filter because porous filters have too much flow restriction for it to work. Uh, we've tried that. Um, so it's really important that it's a, a screen. But that, that screen, that mesh size 5 micron, seems to work, work pretty well. Um, so that's an overview of how it works. This is a, just kind of a timeline. So a typical method for us right now is 17 minutes. We really haven't, from end to end, we really haven't taken the steps to sort of rigorously optimize that. But we, we do sort of a, a preload step here where we flush all of the component, components in that flex cube with water. Then we load for five minutes. We have a brief washing step, 30 seconds, with just water to elude any really polar compounds from the SPE material. 
and then we execute our analytical separation over about five minutes, and then there's some you know, re-equilibration and rinsing steps at the end. So this is a pretty typical protocol for us. Um, and again, so really the two, couple of the big things um, that we found to be really useful is again this mesh screen to protect the FlexCube pump. And uh, Agilent has also helped us install a pressure sensor to monitor the pressure uh, being generated by that FlexCube pump as a, as a way of predicting, basically predicting failure. So we can monitor pressure over the cartridge over time so that when we see the pressure start to creep up, because it does, I mean, we're inevitably pumping particles into that thing. Um, as we see the pressure creep up, we know we need to change the cartridge in a, at a convenient time as opposed to having to have it fail, say, during the night or something like that. So those, those two things have been important to us. So here's some representative data. Um, what I have on the left is uh, MSMS chromatograms for the six compounds. What a, what a, for one of them, we have a deuterated internal standard. Um, these are 200 part per trillion spikes in uh, five, mil water, uh, five mil samples of creek water. And as I said, we've been doing a lot of uh, uh, standard addition. So on the right, you see for two of the compounds, um, basically the matrix effect comparing basically deionized water to spikes in this creek water sample. And you see in the case of sulfonidoxazole, we have maybe significant suppression there or some kind of matrix effect. And actually in the case of Tylosin, we actually see a signal enhancement um, in the creek water. Um, and so again, this is really why we like the standard edition because then we don't have to worry about that so much. Um, and for some of these compounds, and uh, isotope label internal standards are not available. So to address the issue of carryover, what I'm showing here is for two compounds, again, uh, a 25 PPT spike and wastewater effluent followed immediately by a water blank. And you can see that, you know, we're, we have really, really good blanks with this system. Certainly for these compounds, sub uh, PPT levels, I mean, we, we don't even detect anything. I'm sort of happy about that. So like I said, most recently we've been moving toward uh, developing this into a 2D separation method for a variety of reasons. One, because that's that's really what our focus is and we're interested in sort of performance improvements that we can realize with the 2D method, but also we, by doing this, we minimize, further minimize matrix effects and also keep our mass spectrometer relatively clean. Um, our experience has been that if we just run a 1D method using this setup after 50 samples, the, the interface looks pretty ugly, pretty dirty. Uh, but with this 2D method, uh, you know, we can run for days, uh, days and days without having to clean it at all. So the approach is um, the red line here shows the uh, solvent gradient through our first dimension column. And in the little window that's kind of tan in color there, um, under these conditions, all of our compounds elute from the first column in that window. And so we basically take one big heart cut effectively out of that uh, segment and transfer all of that fluid to the second dimension column and then execute the, the, the next solvent gradient shown in blue. And uh, we have the conditions here. We've changed up the, both of these columns are reverse phase columns. We change up the chemistry a little bit so we get a little bit a, a different elution order. So that's the approach. And so in here now, um, as I said, the, uh, what's, what we really like about this, this Agilent system is it makes 2D separations uh, sufficiently easy that it's not that big of a deal to combine the online SPE with the 2D separation. And so uh, for some details, uh, what's shown up here is that we're using uh, the valve, the interface valve between the two dimensions in such a way, uh, the so-called counter current uh, configuration of the valve so that the, the sample comes into the loops one way and gets flushed out uh, in the other way. They're, you could say they're maybe back flushed. Um, and then the everything I just described, the online SPE part in the flux cube is basically used is the front end here to the 2D separation. And um, this is the, the eight port two position valve that's used as the interface between the two dimensions. So we add a second column here and a second pump. And we also dilute the solvent as it comes out of this first column with a little bit of water. And then we're going into the same uh, variant triple quad detector. And uh, I guess the other thing, I benefit I didn't mention before is we see that when we, when we look at the chromatograms for the 2D separation here, Compared to the 1D separation of the same exact sample, 5 milliliter injection, and the whole thing, we see that the baselines are a lot cleaner, which, which we expect. So what we have here is an overlay of uh, the chromatograms we get for two of these compounds in either the 1D configuration in green or the 2D configuration in red. You can, you can see that there's just a lot less um, background signal, I guess, in these MS-MS detection channels. So that's a benefit as well. 
So then this slide is similar to what I showed you before, but now in the 2D separation case, so we have 200 part per trillion spikes uh, on the left in, in creek water again, following these uh, 2D separations. And some of these compounds, the Cipro and tetracycline here, we've had trouble with. We've actually, and, and so these chromatograms don't look as good as in the 1D case, but this is primarily was a problem uh, of drift with our detector, loss of sensitivity, which we actually just figured out <laughs> Uh, solved in the in the last week, so we expect that those will look a little better in the future. And then on the right, we have standard addition curves for two of the compounds. Um, in one of our effluent samples, we routinely see high levels on this order, one part per billion for sulfamidoxazole and uh, about 200 parts per trillion for ciprofloxacin. So again, just uh, representative data there. And I'll point out that these, so the sulfamidoxazole data look great here, right? Um, very nice curve. The Cipro doesn't look so good, and we're absolutely, totally, utterly convinced that this is uh, more of a problem with our detection variability. That's very compound specific. Specific. And again, this is related to the, um, the issue I mentioned a couple moments ago. So from our perspective, in terms of getting sample into the detector in a precise way using this online SP setup, it's very precise. And we've checked that out using UV detection uh, and things like that. So again, that's uh, representative data. So in our experience, um, this online SP system as a front end to whatever kind of detection or front end to a 2DLC system is very, very robust. Uh, we're very pleased. We routinely run it overnight now. Uh, so we'll walk up to the instrument with, uh, in our case, 10 samples um, and then uh, run replicates on those overnight. Again, getting back to this question of how many samples you can do, 50 uh, with basically unattended, um, except for walking up with new sets of 10 samples um, is pretty routine for us. Again, uh, installation of this mesh, mesh screen has been really important to achieving that. And um, Again, the, the two capabilities, the online SP and the 2DLC, are sufficiently easy to use that we've been really able to, to couple those ideas uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and, and like I said, we're very happy with the carryover and, and the robustness of the system allows us to do standard edition uh, for quantitation routinely. So um, Agent obviously has been instrumental in, in supporting us with this work, and uh, I have to acknowledge one of my collaborators um, at the University of St. Thomas for, uh, and her students for gathering most of the waters, uh, water samples that I've shown here. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Have you tried doing your recoveries without using EDTA? And if you have, what sort of recoveries? Is it necessary to add so much EDTA to your samples? I don't know that we've... Um, so the reason... The reason we started using EDTA is because that was... Uh, that was what was published in the Uncle Chemistry paper. Yes. Uh, but so I don't know that we've, uh, especially in the online approach, I don't know that we've necessarily evaluated the importance of EDTA from a recovery perspective. But what we definitely know is that uh, it helps us maintain the performance of the analytical column. If we don't have it there, peak shapes run downhill in a pretty big hurry. So in this case... The so analytical column only sees the EDTA in terms of whatever comes out of the cartridge. So it's not a very big amount, but it seems to be important. Otherwise, we, ha we run, you know, 20 samples, and then we have to take the column offline and run some EDTA through and then reinstall it. Uh, do you add the EDTA to the standards, then, that you're injecting? Or yeah. do the standards go through SPE also, I guess? Yeah, everything goes through this yeah, on that SPE. So it's, it's uniform across those, yeah. Have you tried different kinds of sta stationary phases on your SP, and what results did you get if you did? Uh, no, but uh, we've had a, quite a lot of conversation about that, and that's job one once I get home. Yeah, I mean, because it's not optimized at all. And I think we, we've looked a little bit about at the effect, basically doing an experiment where we vary the injection volume and look at the linearity response, and I think we're probably losing some of some or all of these compounds, so we really need to focus on optimizing the chemistry. It was This is just a starting point, basically. I was just wondering if you had ever looked at the effluent from the trap that's coming off in the uh, rinse step to see if it contains compounds that you may have missed? Uh, no, but we that's certainly in our plans for as a, as a in the process for evaluating what's actually going on in there. Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, that's very rational. 